morning. To those of you who are seeing us on Facebook, welcome. We are going to be starting in another minute, but you are attending the webinar Planning Now and for the Future. Good morning. Welcome to the second installment of Friday webinars at the Business School, UWI Cave Hill. My name is Marjorie Wharton. I am the Strategic Business Services Director and Clinical Faculty with the Sajikor Cave Hill School of Business at UWI Cave Hill, and I am your host for our event today. As you know, the Sajikor Cave Hill School of Business is one of the leading providers of executive education in the region. For the last 29 years, we have been engaged in preparing private sector and public sector leaders to function more effectively in their roles as managers and organizational leaders. At the Business School, we see our mandate as linking the academic, conceptual side of learning to the practical and implementation-focused reality of organizations. As such, we use a combination of academics and professionals as subject matter experts in our academic programs, our workshops, our conferences and seminars. And that is also our intention with these webinars. Our topic today is planning now and for the future an economic and financial outlook. This webinar will be looking at the current and prospective reality for the region, recognizing that many of our economies, businesses, jobs, and income streams have been impacted by the pandemic. This session will discuss what is likely to emerge in the near future and what we should be doing to prepare for or respond to it. Our webinar is scheduled for an hour and 15 minutes. We have two panelists who will be sharing their perspectives and insights with us. And we are asking you, our audience, to share your questions as well. On your screens, you will find the control panel, which will give you an option labeled Q and A. You may use that option at any point during the webinar to send us your questions. You can also feel free to use the chat feature. As we go along, our panelists will select and respond to as many of those questions as they can. Let me start now by telling you a little bit about our panelists. Ms. Marcia Cyrus is a financial services professional with over 20 years in the banking, investments, and personal finance sectors. She started her investment banking career with London Life Insurance, moved on to the Bank of Montreal, and then the Royal Bank of Canada. Besides her investment banking career, Marcia has served as a consultant in various financial areas and a tutor in personal financial literacy, financial planning, and small business accounting. She is a CPA and a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Barbados. She holds an MSc in Investments and Wealth Management and a BSc in Economics and Management. Welcome to you, Marcia Cyrus. Thank you. Professor Justin Robinson has served at the University of the West Indies for 22 years, joining the Cave Hill campus as a lecturer in the Department of Management Studies in 1997. Since 2012, he has served as the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences, and from 2018, he has been the CEO of the Cave Hill School of Business. Justin has an impressive publication output and has written almost 30 journal articles and book chapters, as well as three technical reports on finance in Barbados. His research areas include national culture and organizational management, corporate finance in developing countries, as well as capital markets and market efficiency in developing countries. His service to national, regional, and international public and scholarly bodies is also noteworthy, such as his post as first vice president of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society and financial advisor to the Barbados Cooperative Credit Union League. Welcome to you, Professor Robinson. Yeah, hi, thanks Marjorie, good morning everyone. Thank you very much. And so now we start with our program. Everywhere there is a concern about where we are financially. Internationally, stock markets are volatile and oil prices are plummeting. Airlines are in financial trouble. The travel and tourism industry has ground to a halt. Manufacturing plants are being challenged to remain open as their employees are getting sick and they are unable to work. There are threats of recession that are emerging everywhere. 
Within our region, there is concern about the prospects for our national economies, about the potential for business growth, having to deal with the prospect of losing your own job or the impact of large scale unemployment. To say that these are uncertain and troubling times would be an absolute understatement. As we get started today, I'm going to ask our panelists to lead us off with their opening comments on where we are and what we should be paying attention to at this time. Professor Robinson, I'm going to ask you to start us off by providing uh, a macro perspective on the situation. All right, thanks Marjorie and good morning again. I hope to our audience, hope everyone is well in this troubling time. So I'm going to share my screen briefly with a few points. Okay, so underlying the economic and financial crisis is really a massive global health crisis. As we speak, more over now the epicenter of the health crisis is largely in the United States and in Europe, where they account for about 90% of the confirmed cases and deaths. But while the Caribbean is probably is not as yet and hopefully will not get to be the center of the health crisis, we are quite likely to be on the front line of the economic crisis that falls out from this, given that we are largely tourist dependent countries, we are very open to trade as small island developing states. So first I'm gonna share some forecasts about what is projected for economic growth across the Caribbean. So the IMF put this out about two weeks ago. So for 2020, Guyana is the only country in the Caribbean that is forecasted to have positive GDP growth, again, because of circumstances unique to them. And that growth has been forecasted as high as 80%, it's been scaled down to about 60, and could yet go lower. And as we come down, we see Aruba is expected to be the worst affected country in the Caribbean. Forecasted GDP decline of about 15%. Then you have Belize, Barbu Antigua and Barbuda, St. Lucia, Bahamas, St. Kitts, Nevis, Grenada. So on average, really, the IMF is projecting a decline in economic growth of about 5 to 6% across Barbados, the Eastern Caribbean, Jamaica. Now, interestingly, the IMF is predicting a large rebound of growth in 2021. So in orange, you have the 2021. So the IMF has all of the economies rebounding back to positive growth. So they are predicting today what you sort of call a V-shaped a a recession. You have a sharp decline, and then you go back up quite quickly. Standard & Poor's would have done some recent credit rating upgrades and they have a somewhat worse picture for the declines in 2020 for the countries that they rate. In terms of their rate, recent ratings reviews, Standard & Poor's has Aruba declining by 25% this year, Barbados by 18%, 17.6%, the Bahamas 16 Jamaica 13 and so on. And also somewhat like the IMF, S&P is predicting a significant rebound to positive growth in 2021, although not as well. The projected declines are larger from S&P and the rebounds are, are not as strong, except in the case of Aruba. And to some extent, sort of looking at this framework, which is, which is being used by the, the famous consulting firm McKinsey, Really, the depth of the recession and the speed of the rebound is really going to be driven on one hand by health factors. Are we able to control the virus spread in terms of what's the quality of the public health response and the capacity to bring the virus under control? So the economic crisis is largely driven by the fact that we've had to shut down our economies to fight the virus to the extent to which you have an effective public health response and you're able to bring the virus under control, that impacts the depth of the recession and the speed of the rebound. And the other factor then is the nature of the government intervention. 
Because one of the real concerns you have as a policy maker is that because you've shut down for a health crisis, when that health crisis passes, you should be able to rebound quickly. But if during that down period, enough companies go bankrupt, enough persons go bankrupt, when the health the crisis passes, the capacity of the economy to rebound could be limited if so much damage has been done. So whether you have, so the depth of the recession and the speed with which you rebound is really driven by two things. One, the, the effectiveness and speed with which the virus is brought under control and the extent to which the economic damage done during that down period is mitigated so that you have the capacity to rebound quickly when that virus passes. So any number of scenarios could play out depending on the interplay between controlling the virus and the ability of governments to mitigate the fallout. So what I would argue in a general sense that in terms of the nature of the responses from governments, I would wanna suggest that government responses should be guided by three general principles. They should be timely, in the sense, governments need to move fast in a crisis. The speed of the response is critical so that you don't lose productive capacity. So speed is important. It should also be targeted. The government only has so much, governments in the Caribbean only have so much money to help address this. And that, that needs to be spent in the, great, in the areas of greatest impact and need in the sense that the limited ammunition can't be wasted. And also the response should be temporary. So that when the crisis ends, that, that, it can, that you can roll back that spending. Otherwise, you create structural deficits and debt problems. So you want responses that are temporary. In a sense, the cure shouldn't be one that creates long-term health problems for the economy. So what I would argue is that one, in terms of targeted responses, any money we use should first of all go to public health measures. because That is the core of the problem. We need to invest in building up our healthcare capacity, testing capability, and the whole public health environment. How can we control the virus and encourage people around the region that the public health environment is one that they can maneuver in safely? How do you convince tourists that your airport is a safe place to come through? That if they come here and get sick, that they can get the treatment. I would also want to suggest that assistance be focused around households first. In a sense, money the government gets to household will naturally flow into the hands of businesses. Money directed at businesses might not necessarily get to households in the same way. In a sense, if you give a cash grant or something to a household, are they going to spend that money on food, et cetera? So, so, so funds directed to households will naturally flow into the hands of households. However, some businesses are going to be particularly vulnerable and affected. So again, the state wants to target those businesses to minimize the corporate bankruptcies. And while you're doing that, there's a process of reimagination. What is the next normal? Because COVID is likely to be what we call a discontinuous shift where you don't just go back to normal. And what are the implications for how the economy reinvents itself. In a sense, the government wants to help in imagining the post-COVID-19 recovery. And fifthly, how do you incentivize and create that new economy? So areas like e-commerce, delivery services, what are the industries that are going to come into their own, so to speak, as we move into a post-COVID environment? And how can the government incentivize that? For me, it's also, I mean, I guess, for, from my end, I think it's important that these new opportunities arising from COVID-19, that they don't all go to the traditional large players in the private sector. This can be an opportunity for new entrepreneurs to emerge, new wealth to be created. Okay, so that, that, that's pretty much my opening spiel, Marjorie. Thanks for that. All right, thank you very much, Professor Robinson. Ms. Cyrus? Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, should be coming up in a second. 
Okay, so good morning, viewers and listeners. I'd like to thank my alma mater for inviting me to this forum today to discuss managing during the COVID-19 pandemic. It is really a difficult time for everyone. We have never seen anything like this before. I mean, it sounds a little cliched now, but I mean, this is a situation where every single sector and every single individual that you can think of is experiencing some type of downturn. Downturn. In some of the other crises that we've seen in the past, we have turned to our parents, our family, our friends for support, but now pretty much we're all in the same boat. It means that we have to be stronger than ever. But what adds to the angst is that we have no idea of the end game. And this could go on for several months, especially if there's no vaccine. And even when our governments open their economies, some of our businesses will not have the capital to reopen quickly or in some cases at all. So we could have a prolonged unemployment and a deepening recession. And as Justin alluded to earlier, S&P is already predicting a fall in our GDP um, of about 17% um, in Barbados. So that's at the macro level, but we're all wondering what happens at the individual level. And I want to share a bit of statistics with you uh, around the Caribbean and our household debt. Uh, we, we have a much lower household debt than the rest of the world as a, as a region, CARICOM. However, we have some pretty high levels um, led by Bahamas. Bahamas has the highest level of household debt, followed by Antigua and then Barbados. And what, what we've seen, case in point, in Barbados, Household debt has grown from about $500 million at the end of 1990 to about $4.5 billion by the end of 2010, which represents somewhere in the region of 60% of our GDP. So that means that, for instance, the average household in Barbados owes about $53,000 in debt. Uh, there was also a study done in Trinidad and Tobago, and that estimated that the debt levels for households was about $20.6 billion, which represents about 30%, 22%, I'm sorry, of the, um, I'm sorry, I realized I wasn't really moving my screen. <laughs> that represented probably somewhere in the region of 22% of, of GDP. And we have a, a situation in Jamaica where households are servicing three times more debt than a decade ago. So, and to put it more even in perspective, we're talking about the Bank of Jamaica. They indicated that about $57 of every $100 of each household goes towards the, surf the servicing of personal loans, right? So I say that all to say that at the end of the day, the fact that we are in so much debt su suggests that we are going to be having some significant challenges in meeting our, our, our daily needs and so on. Just to go a little bit further, um, the highest debt across the, the region is held uh, by the mortgage in the mortgage category, followed by consumer debt, which is the second main source of household debt. We also have the credit card debt, which grew um, at an annual average of about 8% in Barbados, so from approximately 93 million in 2000 to 347 million in trying to keep up with my, my screen, sorry, um, to about 93 to 347 million in 2017. And the Central Bank Stability Report recently indicated that there were about $607 million in personal credit card transactions in 2018. So what we we're looking at some fairly tough situations for individuals and households um, at the moment. First of all, um, I mean, I hope we can get to all of these topics um, later on in the conversation. But first of all, you must know your financial situation. How much cash do I have at home, at the bank? How much cash do I have to have access to? These are questions we all have to answer ourselves. How much funds do I need to pay my rent, my mortgage, pay utilities, buy food, medication? In other words, to take care of the basics. Who do I owe? Credit cards, bank or credit unions, lines of credit, overdraft facilities. What are those numbers? Who can I reschedule for another period without incurring additional costs, 
right? Um, I'm also gonna go down the cliched line again and ask the question, do we have a budget? I know it's something that's been spoken about time and time again, but I recognize even from my banking days and talking to clients who were facing financial distress, that there were come a, a number of common things that were, were, were noted, that I noted. One, they did not know what it cost them to, to, to provide for themselves for, for a month, right? They did not know their loan balances and the corresponding interest rates. The same for credit cards. Some people did not even know how, what their limits were. They did not know how much money they saved per month, if any, and they did not have any investments, and neither did they have an emergency fund. In other words, they were not exercising any type of control. They were literally rolling from month to month with no vision, no goal setting, no deliberate actions. So to change this, we have to be very disciplined. We have to be very deliberate. And you know what? This COVID time gives us an opportunity to work on those areas that we've neglected in the past. So one of the things that I would want to, to talk about a little bit later is tracking your expenses for at least one month. I'm not a proponent of continuing to track expenses ad nauseum or for, you know, any longer, any, for any extended period. I would say that we need to make sure we know at least for one month and then we make provisions for those items that are one-off items that you will, and you will um, have to pay during the course of the year. So for instance, things like car insurance, house insurance, land tax, et cetera, right? Pay more than the minimum on your credit card. Right. I think that most credit card holders do not realize how costly having a credit card is. You know sometimes what the interest rate is associated with your card, but you do not realize the implications of not paying back that card or paying more than a minimum. The reality is that you're is a revolving credit and you're going to be paying interest on principal and interest every month. Right. So, for instance, to just give a quick example, if you had a one thousand dollar credit card, at a 21% rate, and you were paying the minimum of $40 a month, it will actually take you 76 months to pay it off. So by the end of that period, you would have paid $3,040 for that $1,000. So that's just giving you uh, an indication of how critical it is to understand these, these, these issues and to pay attention to them. So one of the other things I want to we'll get into later then is making getting out of debt a priority. There's several methods. I have my preferred method. I also want you to look at how, what it takes to consolidate debt. Sometimes consolidating debt is a necessary step, especially when you find yourself in trouble with credit card debt. And I also want to talk about avoiding debt that is not for productive purposes, okay? So as we go, and then also, I mean, the old age, old adage that we have heard over and over from our grandmothers, separate your wants from your needs. So in conclusion, I want to say that consumer, consumerism and branding has invaded our psyche to the point where we get into debt to keep up, to keep up. Right? So the management of your debt and your level of education are not necessarily directly correlated. Many well-qualified persons make some very poor financial decisions. I believe it is really time to teach these concepts in schools and parents should send their children to camps and other um, events that can teach to help teach them financial literacy and investing. So with that, I will hand back over to our host, Marjorie. Thank you very much, Marcia. And thank you, both of you, for some very strong comments and uh, really a lot of information for us to unpack. So I really want us to maybe delve into a little bit of what you said.